Could we somehow sequence the DNA from our long-deceased ancestors? This is something that a lot of genetic genealogists have wished they could do, but it actually is possible. Hello everybody, I am Jer Rossagini Vlogger, and on today's video, I will be discussing how to sequence your deceased ancestors' DNA. But first, a word from me. Are you looking for help with your genealogy research? Trying to understand your DNA match list and not sure how to proceed? Need advice on how to overcome that family brick wall? Then schedule a consultation with me. I'm offering half hour long and hour long one-on-one -on -one sessions where you meet with me over Zoom and we go over your family research. Just send me an email at genievlogger@gmail.com and set up your consultation today. Now back to the video. DNA testing older generations is extremely beneficial to genetic genealogy because their DNA can tell us so much more about past generations, and especially connections even further back in the past. So it would make sense that genetic genealogists would want to test deceased ancestors because those older generations could tell us so much more about the past. But luckily there are methods to sequence the DNA of the deceased. Now the first, which I don't think is any major surprise, is exhumation. But it is extremely difficult to do, and laws are going to vary state by state and country by country, so location will be a big deal. You usually have to get the consent of every single known living descendant of that person. You often have to get the descent of whoever's running the burial grounds, and you may need to get descent of descendants of the people buried around the ancestor you're trying to exhume, because sometimes you may have to disturb those graves, so you need their permission as well. And if one person out of all of those people decides that they don't want that, then you're not going to get approval. You have to get everybody to be on board. But even if you successfully navigate that first part of the process of getting the proper paperwork in place, you now need to coordinate the actual exhumation and pay for it, which it could actually cost you sometimes in the tens of thousands of dollars. So it is not cheap. And then once you've had the exhumation done, now you need to go through the process of doing the DNA testing, which is a multi-step process that is also going to cost a lot of money. And these various phases of testing are going to include the extraction of the DNA, the analyzing of the DNA, and then the actual sequencing of the DNA. But it's also possible that there may be difficulties as this process goes on, so you may have to redo certain steps. You may have to re-extract the DNA. You may have to try to sequence it multiple times. And sometimes you might not even get viable results in the end, even after spending all of that time and money trying to get it done. And this isn't uncommon because the DNA that you're often dealing with with exhumations can often be highly degraded DNA, and you may have very small amounts of DNA, as well as the possibility of contamination from other animals, bacteria, or whatever. But there are other ways to get your ancestors' DNA sequenced. And the next best option is what's known as artifact testing. And this is just DNA testing artifacts that may have the DNA from your ancestors. The typical items for this are sealed envelopes and stamps, but can also include a various amount of other items that might have DNA in them, things like toothbrushes, dentures, smoking pipes, and anything else that you can think of where DNA from your ancestor might have gotten in and is then trapped. Sealed envelopes and stamps are often the go-to for this just because it traps the DNA very well, and it's a fairly common thing for a lot of people to have, letters and envelopes from their ancestors, sometimes dating back really far into the 1800s. Artifact testing first gained traction with the genealogy community through the company To The Letter DNA, an Australian company who unfortunately announced that they were closing just a day after I started writing the outline of this script. But they aren't the only company in the space. Genetic Legacies, which used to be known as Keepsake DNA, quickly made its way to the top of the field. I had a chance to talk with the owners of Genetic Legacies while I was at Roots Tech this year, and they told me that they had been having quite amazing success rates. Beyond Genetic Legacies, I know that some of the bigger genealogy companies are looking into the artifact testing world, with MyHeritage having it announced that they are in the process of getting this on board. And I feel like I also remember Ancestry talking about looking into this as well, but I couldn't find anything confirming that, so if anyone knows or remembers Ancestry saying that 
they're looking into artifact testing, comment down below and let me know. Either way, I think it's very likely we're going to see artifact testing becoming a more and more common way of testing. I also expect rootless hair DNA testing to hit the consumer market sometime in the next few years, maybe the next 10 years, which is honestly one of the most common questions I get whenever I talk about artifact testing because it's such a common thing that people have strands of hair with no root on them. But this type of testing is already proven feasible. There are private labs that do conduct this type of testing for non-consumer market. So basically the forensic world, but it's just a matter of time before it becomes available. But if you happen to have hairs with roots, then that sort of testing is already available to the consumer market and actually genetic legacies offers that as one of their services. Of course, there are multiple issues with artifact testing, and the biggest one is an ethical one, and that's really the possibility of people nefariously sending in the DNA of living people to try to get their DNA profile. Genetic Legacies requires its customers to sign paperwork which outlines prohibited uses, which even has a special section explaining what will happen if someone submits DNA from a living individual, including contacting the authorities and litigation. But people may still try, and there's always the possibility that it won't be caught. This is obviously an issue that is already on their mind. The second issue with artifact testing is that it's expensive. It's nowhere near the cost of an exhumation, which like I said, is likely gonna cost into the tens of thousands of dollars. But even so, with this, it's above what most people are going to be able to do at around a couple of thousand dollars to do this. Genetic Legacy's website even shows their pricing for each phase with the cost varying depending on the item that you're sending in, but you're basically looking at around 2,000 or less for the entire process. The third issue with this type of testing is the unknown origin of the DNA. So not quite like what we were saying before of someone nefariously sending in a living person's DNA, but just thinking that the DNA on this item is grandma, when in reality it might have been the mailman who put that stamp on the envelope. A joke I've heard about artifact testing from genetic genealogist Blaine Bettinger is that we're going to end up sequencing postmasters over and over and over because they were helping and licking and putting on stamps for so many people. But also you just never know who might have been using items and also things that might have been handled by other family members may have been contaminated with their DNA. But another major issue to consider is that whatever you send in for artifact testing, you may not get back. And if you do get it back, it likely won't be the same. Extracting DNA often requires destroying that item to get the most DNA out of it. So if that one item that you wanna send in is actually something you really treasure, you may not wanna do it because you may not get it back. At best, whatever you send in will only have a little bit of damage to it, or maybe they just try to take off one piece. So like if you send in an entire envelope, maybe they'll cut out the stamp for you, send the rest of the envelope back. But whatever you send in, just expect that you're not going to see it again. And the last major issue is that you may not get a viable profile in the end. Just like with the exhumation process, it's the same sort of DNA processing process, but you still have the same issues of low amounts of DNA and degraded DNA. Now, luckily with artifact testing, they usually break it into two phases. That way, if one phase fails, you don't end up paying for the entire thing. But in my experience with lab work like this, when you do the extraction process, sometimes you need to do another extraction because you didn't get enough DNA. And after a couple of times, then you may finally get what you need. And then when you go to sequence that DNA, you may have to go through that step multiple times as well. But I imagine that is a very high possibility that you may send something in. They aren't able to extract what they need at first. They say we can try it again with maybe a second item, which Genetic Legacies even says on their website something about a backup item. But either way, it can be very difficult to get viable profiles. Luckily, there already is a technology that can help us overcome these issues of low amounts of DNA and highly degraded DNA, and this technology is known as Contelligence. Developed by Verigen, a forensic biotechnology company, the basic idea of Contelligence is that they test for less DNA markers and thus can use less DNA than typical testing methods. The typical DNA test used in genetic genealogy is known as a SNP microarray and tests for around 700,000 DNA markers. 
but Contelligence only tests 10,230 DNA markers, just over 1% of the number of markers from typical SNP microarrays. That's a massive difference and makes it much more possible to create viable DNA profiles from artifact testing. Contelligence technology is extremely new with the first solved case only being in 2022 with the identification of Kenneth W. Heasley's remains. I was actually the genealogist who worked that case and I was surprised how amazingly well Contelligence worked. The Contelligence results are somewhat different and don't as confidently capture relatives past a third cousin distance, whereas typical SNP microarray tests can easily capture relatives past a third cousin distance. But sometimes DNA samples are just too small or too degraded, and so Contelligence helps fill that gap. Unfortunately, this is not something available to the consumer market just yet. It's limited to the forensic market, but I imagine it will eventually reach the consumer market, and when it does, its biggest impact will be on that artifact testing. But beyond exhumation and artifact testing, we have a third option to sequence the DNA of our deceased ancestors, reconstructed genomes. This is the idea of reconstructing your ancestors' genomes by identifying the DNA that you inherited from that ancestor along with DNA that other descendants inherited from that same ancestor. The basic idea is that when you identify the shared DNA to known relatives, your known shared ancestors must have had the same DNA sequence in their genome. So the more relatives that we can identify, the more of our ancestors' genome that we can reconstruct. As an example, let's say you want to reconstruct your paternal grandfather's DNA. You start by identifying all of the DNA matches who are relatives through your grandfather's side. In this example, you find 10 matches, including an aunt and a first cousin. First, we see what DNA we share with all of the relatives except your aunt and first cousin. This is because your aunt and first cousin shared DNA with you from both your paternal grandfather and paternal grandmother, but we want to isolate the DNA inherited through just your paternal grandfather. Whatever DNA is shared with these other eight relatives, that DNA had to be a part of your paternal grandfather's genome, creating the first pieces of reconstruction. But now we're going to utilize the aunt's DNA profile to compare against those same eight relatives, because whatever DNA the aunt shares with them also had to be inherited through your paternal grandfather. Then we do the same thing with your first cousin and any other descendants of your grandfather that may test. With enough segments of DNA identified, we can reconstruct the genome and create a viable profile to upload to DNA databases for comparison. Now this is not easy to do, but there are a few tools out there that do allow you to do this type of process. One available tool for reconstructed genomes is known as Lazarus, which is on GEDmatch. And I find this is often the most discussed tool when it comes to reconstructed genomes. Part of GEDmatch's tier one membership, it gives you three groups to list your matches. Group zero, the spouse of the target ancestor or relatives through that spouse's side. Group one, descendants of the target ancestor. And group two, relatives through the target ancestor. In the example we use, the aunt and first cousin would be in group one, and the other eight relatives would be in group two. It can be really difficult to actually get a working profile out of Lazarus. You usually need a couple of descendants of your target ancestor, as well as a bunch of various matches from different sides of that ancestor's ancestry. And this can be especially difficult because GEDmatch's database is a little bit on the smaller end of things. So the fewer matches you have to work with, the less that you can really reconstruct. I also suspect that there may be a lot of duplicate profiles on GEDmatch, because a lot of people who do DNA testing at multiple companies will upload the profile from each company onto GEDmatch and then create what's known as a super kit where you combine all of them together. I've tested at multiple companies and I have multiple profiles in GEDmatch and I know a bunch of other genetic genealogists who do the same. But the Lazarus tool is not the only tool available. You can also do reconstructed genomes on the website Borland Genetics. This website has multiple tools to create various types of reconstructed genomes. I've only started using the website and I'm still learning its capabilities, 
but it has a lot of intriguing tools. If you have any experience with the Borland Genetics website, comment down below and let us know. Has it helped you at all and what do you think of their tools? As more and more people do DNA testing and we create more and more reconstructed genomes, it's going to allow us to learn so much more further and further back into the past. But I believe this will also lead to the ability to do what I like to call recursive reconstructed genomes. This is the process of utilizing reconstructed genomes to then reconstruct the genomes of ancestors even further back in time. So if we can reconstruct grandpa's genome as well as a bunch of genomes of grandpa's relatives on both sides, could we then use those to reconstruct the genomes of grandpa's grandparents and then just keep taking it back further and further? Imagine being able to reconstruct the genomes of so many various historic figures and then being able to solve all these different mysteries from the past. If a certain person has enough living descendants who've done DNA testing, it really is possible. One figure that comes to mind is Thomas Jefferson, who had many children with multiple women and possibly even more than what we already know. I could even see a project with Jefferson's descendants all coming together where we slowly reconstruct the genome going back generation by generation until we're able to start reconstructing Thomas Jefferson's actual genome. Part of what makes me think of Thomas Jefferson is just the fact that he has so many living descendants who have already participated in various DNA studies over the years, some of them even dating back into the 90s when DNA testing was in its infancy. So there may already be enough DNA to get that sort of project started. But just think of all the possibilities of who we could do that for. And then combine reconstructed genomes and recursive reconstructed genomes along with all of the profiles from artifact testing. And it's probably going to become commonplace, possibly in the next five years, that genetic genealogists will have DNA profiles for people from the 19th century, the 18th century, and maybe even earlier. And while it isn't quite as commonplace now, there still are a lot of amazing ways to be able to utilize your DNA results to uncover family mysteries. And you can learn all about one of those ways in this video of mine right here. Thank you to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members.